Welcome to the best of the action from leg eight of the Whitbread Round the World race for the Volvo Trophy. Coming up, the restart from Annapolis as the feet wrestles for the early advantage. We bring you all the race action as the boats charge north into iceberg territory and strong winds. And what price for a Whitbread 60? We take a closer look at the investments made to get onto the podium. Plus, we're dockside in La Rochelle as the fleet brings to a close its 3,390-mile transatlantic journey. First, though, a look back at leg seven and the memorable first-place finish of Brunel Sanergy. Underdog turned wonderdog. Opting for a more easterly course than the fleet, Roy Heiner picked up stronger winds early on and accelerated to the front, a position he held onto until the finish line in Baltimore, despite frantic attempts by the chasing pack. Behind, Swedish match scored a moral victory over EF Language for second, but did little to the overall points table. While Chesi Racing and Toshiba in seventh and eighth gave the race its closest finish in history, with just ten seconds separating the two at the gun. But Team Toshiba has a knack of stirring up controversy, and it wasn't long after Dennis Connor took his team across the line and into port that the next altercation was to rear its head. Arriving into port, EF Education was flying more than just a spinnaker and a smile. Fluttering off the backstay, a red protest flag clearly announced EF's intention to protest to Sheba for violating the right-of-way rules by crossing directly in front of it during the night. For EF skipper Christine Guiou, a veteran ocean racer, it was more an issue of safety than rules, and one she was determined not to let pass by. We take risk. It's taking risk compared to uh, the, uh, the people who are on board uh, for, for my crew. And I really think that uh, this, if we didn't succeed to avoid uh, Toshiba, uh, the collision would have been very, very bad because we were going fast. For Dennis Connor, there was no question mark over whether or not he was in the wrong. It was simply a case of the jury confirming that he had exonerated himself by completing a 720-degree penalty turn after the incident. Flying in from San Diego for the protest hearing, Connor appeared tired, yet relaxed and confident in front of the five-man jury. Leaving the judges to deliberate over the facts and anxious crew members waiting, Dennis Connor was far from expecting the eventual ruling. A two-place penalty for Toshiba for failing to execute its penalty turns quick enough. I was uh, surprised and uh, disappointed. I have a lot of uh, respect for the jury. They're, it was a good jury, and uh, you know, I respect their decision. And just uh, disappointed, particularly in the view of the fact that we'd done our uh, penalty turns as soon as we knew there was an incident. And that wasn't the only news to shock Connor. The resignation of navigator Andrew Cape also delivered a major blow. Totally surprised. I spent uh, three days with him and had no inkling of it. It seemed like he was in a good mood and everything was fine, so it certainly uh, caught me off guard. Connor was quick to react, hiring in New Zealander Murray Ross, twice Whitbread veteran and consultant to the winning boats in the 93 94 race. That he has more recently been a day sailor than an ocean racer seemed a little concern to Connor. He was just hoping that this was the man who would turn Toshiba's fortunes around. So, after seven legs, EF Language's lead remains unchallenged. The only move up the table was from the Norwegians, up to fourth and within touching distance of third. Brunel's outstanding win did little to its eighth, but it now lies within ten points of Toshiba, following Connor's two-place penalty. The next leg is poised to be crucial. Many people think that this near three and a half thousand mile leg to La Rochelle in France will be a simple romp home. 
In reality, this could be one of the most difficult legs, with one of the more complex weather systems across the Atlantic, coupled with the prospect of ice and conditions equal to that of the Southern Ocean. This league is interesting because for us, because it's um, back into the real world. We've left the Brazil, we've left Fort Lauderdale, left the tropics, left the trade winds. We're back into the uh, westerlies where there's a series of sort of depressions rolling across the North Atlantic. So we've got to sort of um, work our way around fronts and depressions again. We've got to go skirt around the Azores High and over to France. So um, back into the real world, back into fronts, back into uh, changeable weather. Before the fronts, the boats still have to navigate the Chesapeake. And with 120 miles to go before reaching open water, much of it is likely to be at night. Then, once out to sea, the navigator's nightmares are far from over. The thing that's different for this leg compared with the last leg is we've actually got two water currents to contend with. We've still got the Gulf Stream, which is the hot water that's going with us, which is obviously good news. But we've now got the Labrador current to watch out for as well. You find that further north, that's actually quite a strong current against us uh, and also brings hazards with it. What happens is there's a really warm water, the Gulf Stream, which is coming up here, but there's a Labrador current, which is very, very cold water, coming down uh, and meeting in with the Gulf Stream. That's why the Grand Banks are such a foggy place, because you've got the interaction between cold and warm water. And the other thing that does is it brings icebergs down from the Arctic Circle. And at the moment, the icebergs are, the southernmost icebergs, are round about the top of the Grand Banks. So this is actually the most likely leg of all to see real ice. With her committee, in order to make it slightly safer, have set a northern limit, which hopefully will keep us clear of most of the ice. But we've got the two streams to go between. The shortest course, as always, takes you against the current, and there is the option of the longer course. Try to follow with the Gulf Stream and try to pick up extra miles from that. On the approach to Newfoundland, the navigators will contemplate the merits of a longer, more easterly course, assisted by the Gulf Stream, or the more direct Great Circle route, which will take them to the edge of the exclusion zone, established by the race organisers, concerned by the southerly extent of the ice. With the Azores High normally positioned south of the zone, the fleet's passage through this area will be severely restricted. It's possible that some boats will, will go fairly extreme to try to get into a low-pressure system, and if they succeed, they can go off like an express train, like, like on the Southern Ocean lakes, and make big, big gains. But if it fails, if you just miss the, the low pressure, then you've just gone a lot further distance, so you end up at that. Once out of this dilemma, predictions are doubly impossible, as weather systems become more and more erratic, as the man from the Met Office explains. Towards the end of the race, they're likely to find that they're to the east of the main high pressure area and more affected by low pressure areas. There's a considerable uncertainty about exactly where the low pressures are going to be and how deep they're going to be. But the expected wind they're likely to see is going to be from the west or the northwest. The actual strength and the actual direction depends on the position and the intensities of these low pressure areas, which we just don't know at this stage. The sound of bagpipes and the blessing of the fleet by the Archbishop of Baltimore began proceedings on the morning of the restart. With light winds forecast, the crews might have appreciated a little divine guidance, many of them a bit perturbed by the prospect of challenging the Chesapeake by night. Well, it looks like it's going to be pretty light. I think the worst thing will be if we don't get out of the bay by the time it's dark, um, because there's heaps of lobster pots in the water, which... Um, are going to be really hard to see at night. That's what I'm worried about. If we pick up one of those, it'll be, it'll be really bad. Blessed with a very fast Atlantic crossing prior to the race, Toshiba were preparing for life with their new navigator. On Toshiba, we never have a dull moment, and uh, this is another exciting stopover. Um, yes, we've got uh, Murray Ross with us now from New Zealand. He's a very good navigator. Um, he's slipped into the role very easily and adequately, and I'm looking forward to sailing with him. Prior to the start of the whip red, Toshiba was actually a world record holder for the fastest 24-hour run, uh, which is now held by Silk Cut. Um, so again, we'll try and get back that title um, during this crossing. Laurie Smith and his crew, though, had other ideas. I was talking to Paul Sandwich earlier. He's after your 24-hour record, Laurie. Are you aware of this? Yeah, I know, but I mean, those boys just haven't got it in them, you know. They'll need about five knots of current to get anywhere near it. Their new SAT-B system installed in Baltimore, the British boat were expected to go quickly on this leg. As the Dutch boat, winner of the last leg, left to a fond farewell, Paul Kayard revealed his own plans, particularly for safeguarding his overall lead. I think we're going to try to take the, uh, 
risk out of it all in terms of the overall points by just staying really close to Swedish match until all that sorts out and try to win the race uh, or at least get past them in the last thousand miles. Dropping the rig is one way we'd lose it with Red Round the World Race. Twenty seconds to go to the start. The conditions really very difficult out here. Five to seven knots of breeze. It's an upwind start on board there with the Merrick Cup. Two boats look like they're coming in on port. Chesi Racing and uh, Brunelli on board now with Kayard. Trapped there, buried by the Swedish match and Silk Cut. Three, two, one, fire! Well, that's the start. The two boats on port look like they're going to squeeze through. Certainly Chesi is as the other boats start to tack off. Pretty confined space until they get to the bridge. They haven't got the stress of lots of spectator boats. There's a $25,000 fine for anyone who gets in the way. So pretty different conditions to those that we saw at some of the other starts where it's been completely manic. So as we look down there on the left-hand side of the picture, we see Silk Cut. Pinned back in the picture, Merrick Cup. Silk Cut, that is, that's tacked for the bridge. They're going to turn to Sheba round. To Sheba, I can just see tacking now. And then... Uh, they're forcing Chessy round as they've got to pass through the centre spans of the bridge. The Sheba in the dominant position, but just underneath you've got Chessy easing and squeezing them up, trying to force them into an uncomfortable position to attack. Silk Cut there attacking, going ahead of Swedish match, but at the front to Sheba looking good. Comfortable lead at the moment over these guys. The Sheba close to camera, right hand side of the course. And then you've got Innovation and Merritt, a battle that we expect to continue across the Atlantic. Those two fighting for third position overall at the moment. Overall race leader, Chaos, right at the back of the pack. Now, it looks like they're getting a new sail out from the Silk Cut. Have they seen new breeze? Have they uh, seen something the other guys haven't seen? Left-hand side of pitcher, where there appears to be more breeze. That's Toshiba, close in now. Toshiba in the dominant position. Oh, and coming in left there, that's Chesi Racing, John Kostecki. Good tack there, aggressive tack, and they're going to again try and squeeze Toshiba, force Toshiba to tack. At the moment, Chesi in the dominant position, Toshiba have tacked, and that doesn't look like a comfortable tack. You can see Swedish match on the right-hand side of the picture. On board now. Let's keep it going fast now. That's Earl Williams, keep it going fast. Quick look across, they're going to have to go behind Toshiba. Toshiba got right away. Swedish match hoping to Shiva carry on. They don't want them to tack. If they do, that will pin them down there and they'll be taking their breeze. But predictably, to Shiva tack. Ross McDonald at the helm. And equally predictably, Swedish match tack. You can't afford to be trapped. To Shiva stuck in a hole. Back, Kayard. Well, he won't be happy. You got 6.3 knots of wind. Real light over here on the right side, but there's less current. That's why the boats are playing this right hand side. Jesse knows the bay pretty good, they're over here. Um, but there's a little pressure coming from the left, so it's pretty dicey right now. Paul, did you have trouble getting through the bridge after the start? No, I just screwed up the start, that's all. So KR's still trapped in the back of the pack, close to camera, Chesi racing, right-hand side of pitcher, that was Toshiba. And Merrick Cup and KR still battling it out for the scraps. And the front end, Chesi just dives behind Toshiba, and goes across, got right away there over Silk Cut as Toshiba prepares to attack. Wind gone incredibly light now. Crew got to be so careful in their manoeuvres, jump around on the boat, that slows the boat down. It's so close, it's boat for boat stuff right at the front at the moment. Swedish match though, on the far side of the track are looking good. They've got slightly better breeze. On board now, that's Toshiba down there. Looks to me like they've got through. Yeah, comfortable there. That's Chesi behind Swedish match, and Toshiba are going to attack. They had to make a decision, tack then. Or get forced to perhaps either go behind Swedish match or attack in their dirty air. So we're on board now with Gunnikrantz. Total focus, total concentration. You can see the Shiva down below. That camera angle narrowing the distance between those two. They've pulled ahead now of Chesi, but Chesi are in third. Certainly better than when they came into Baltimore. Finished the last leg in eighth position. Gunnikrantz there, leading the three boats. Just Krantz, Kostecki and Ross McDonald leading the fleet down the Chesapeake. Having negotiated the tricky conditions at the start 
and made steady progress along the Chesapeake Bay. The Whitbread fleet was settling into the last ocean crossing of the race, and by the end of day one, they were heading out into the North American basin and the Atlantic Ocean beyond. Chessie led early on as each navigator, including Toshiba's new man Murray Ross, tried to make sense of the weather information and decide whether to head for the Gulf Stream or follow the Great Circle route to the north. She had a good start. We had the first few hours going down the Chesapeake Bay and then unfortunately during the night, about midnight, we got caught by a, caught up in a fish trap. We couldn't uh, get rid of it until the following morning at daybreak. So unfortunately we ended up in uh, eighth place. Uh, going out the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, but today we're back in the fleet and um, it's basically a race now out to the Gulf Stream. Whoever gets in it first will have a two to three knot advantage. So at the moment we're heading due east and um, the first one to the stream and then we'll start heading north from there. On the morning of day two the wind dropped and the fleet bunched allowing Toshiba to make good their deficit. The lull in the action was well timed for race leaders EF language who was struggling to mend a faulty water maker. A lack of drinking water would pose a serious threat to their stronghold on the race, but to the relief of the crew and the disappointment of their challengers, the problem was solved before the wind filled in again. Sailing further south, Silk Cut was making good progress in conditions which reminded the crew that they were heading home. Day two on Silk Cut. We're about uh, 50 miles outside the Chesapeake now, and uh, anyone would think we're pretty close to England. It's uh, pouring with rain, it's grey, it's overcast, and uh, pretty wet really. By day two it was clear that all the boats were adopting a southerly heading aiming for the Gulf Stream current. And it was the three back markers, Toshiba, Caverna and Merrick Cup, who were furthest south. <laughs> Approaching the Gulf Stream, the wind picked up and conditions on board Chessy Racing were typical. Jib top reaching amongst the choppy waves were taking its toll, resulting in snap shackles and minor rigging damage. Life on board wasn't helped by a flu virus, which had struck down half the Chessy crew as they battled to maintain their promising start. Private jewels for overall supremacy were a familiar theme of the leg, as Innovation Caverna and Merrick Cup shadowed each other at the southern end of the fleet. It's uh, sunset on day two. Uh... By now we're in the southern part of the fleet. Uh, as you might know, we're uh, last on the position report right now. That's quite logical. Everyone that's sort of pointing more towards the north is going more directly towards La Rochelle. However, we expect uh, to reach the Gulf Stream in about five to six hours. Then we'll have a favorable current of two to three knots with us. Uh, we expect to uh, sort of get back to a top position uh, doing that. By day three, the separation in the fleet was becoming evident, with only 22 miles between first and last, but 80 miles between north and south. Having given EF language the slip by heading north, inheriting the lead was a bonus for the Swedes, who were well aware that there would be many changes in fortune before they reached La Rochelle. The Gulf Stream is pushing us with 3.9 knots at the moment, so we are all on this magic carpet that is pushing us across the Atlantic. So by day four, this is the way the fleet split. Swedish match were where they wanted to be with rivals EF language not even on the first page. It was early days though, and there was only just 20 miles between first and last. The fighting had only just begun. So by the middle of the first week, it was already clear that all nine boats were on a northeasterly course, heading for the exclusion zone south of Newfoundland. However, the boats in the south were enjoying the best of the conditions, with a three-way battle developing between Innovation Caverna, Toshiba and the Merrick Cup. For the best part of two days, Caverna and Merrick Cup had covered each other tack for tack, ever mindful of their respective positions in the overall standings. However, on day five, Toshiba and Merrick Cup tacked away from the Norwegians and out of the Gulf Stream as a southeasterly breeze climbed to 20 knots and the boats took a pounding. We've got a 20 degree shift and a lot of numbers come out of the Gulf Stream. Water temperature's gone from uh, 18 degrees to 9 degrees in about uh, 20 minutes. So we've just popped out the forehand side of it. We've got Merritt just to wear of us, probably still in the stream. But you can see she'll come out in probably the next 10, 15 minutes. Otherwise, back to it, shifting weight. Pack 
Ahead of Toshiba, Merrick Karp had eked out a slight advantage. Much the delight of skipper Grant Dalton, whose main concern now was judging the movement of the high-pressure system and how far he should push north. Whilst navigator Mike Quilter did the sums, down below it was dinner time for an exhausted crew and at long, long last, time for some well-earned sleep. Uh, today, good leg for us. Um, Swedish matches back there. We're ahead of Cavern and Chessie, those are our major boats. And uh, we've just got to keep on keeping on. Good concentration on board, no problems with the boat. Uh, we don't really like this tight reaching and bouncing that we're doing. But we're only about 36 hours away from getting a spinnaker on. Merrick Cup's surge to the front was bad news for Swedish match, who, having led earlier in the week, now found themselves somewhat exposed on the northern edge of the fleet and already 60 miles off the pace. Been lost at first and lost again, and I've seen um, six boats out of the total nine being in the lead on this leg, so it's been very turbulent. It's a big high coming down from um, uh, Newfoundland and uh, moving south, southeast, and our strategy is to be as far away from the center of that high as possible. So we need that separation between us and the others to create some sort of leverage, uh, and um, we hope then that our position will give us a bit stronger wind, a better better angle on the wind than the, the rest of the fleet, and thus making us get back what we lost here. In a bid to cover his closest challenges for overall honours, Paul KR2 was in the north, and sailing a course parallel to Swedish match, albeit a little faster. Right now we're enjoying mild temperatures due to the Gulf Stream effect on the climate here. The water temperature is about 70 degrees, so things aren't too tough. We've got a southeasterly breeze blowing about 20 knots, 2 to 13 knots of boat speed. Another 10 days should have us in France. Having led briefly earlier in the week, Silk Cut now found themselves too far south and relegated to sixth place as they struggled in the unfavorable conditions. Well, right now we're just waiting for this, uh, you know, we're, we're in this really bad uh, current. We've had a nothing and a half against us for the last 24 hours. And uh, Merritt and Tashim in particular have had, um, looks like they've got about a knot with them. So you can imagine what happens over 24 hours. And uh, we're, we're quite happy being placed in the south on them in that we've got a much better angle to the mark. So wind-wise we're in good shape. It's just uh, we need, we need uh, the currents to change in our favour, which, as I say, is very, very unpredictable. The current as unpredictable as the ever-changing positions on the leaderboard. By day six, Merritt's nose was in front, with Toshiba in close attendance. The women were in a respectable fourth, while EF language was sticking close to Swedish match, whether at the front of the fleet or at the back. Silk Cut, meanwhile, are off the pace and in last position. Day seven and the high pressure was still dominating the race. The fleet continued to head north, trying to skirt around the top. Pulling further away from tail enders Silk Cut and Chessie Racing, who were stuck down in the south. Both were struggling in light conditions, but on board Chessie Racing, the mood remained optimistic. I appreciate it. It's been a very frustrating last few days, trailing the fleet, getting further behind. But uh, we have a lot of race to go. We're only a third of the way done. And uh, we see some opportunities ahead where we can catch up. Ahead, Swedish match were counting the cost of a misplaced gamble. Predicting the movements of the high-pressure system had proved expensive. At the front, Merritt Cup were closing in on the southeast tip of the exclusion zone. Reaching in a southeasterly breeze of 18 knots and pounding waves, conditions in which this boat does not excel. Reports of icebergs meant the crew were on constant alert. With the Titanic lurking somewhere below them, the fleet homed in on the danger zone, Toshiba taking over the lead. Attempting to skirt the top of the pressure system, the boats converged on the southern edge of the prohibited zone, wedged between the high and the no-go area. However, with the wind filling in from behind, Toshiba and Merritt Cup continued to be locked in constant battle. Uh, Merritt Cup, day seven, um, second position at the moment, we're just over halfway. We've got uh, Toshiba, who's leading at the moment about four miles down here. We've got uh, a southwesterly of around 25 knots, we're running very fast averaging close to 16 knots, but, but quite controllable. And we're waiting really for a jibe now, with the front coming through, the breeze going to the northwest, and hopefully them falling off the, the, uh, the breeze a little earlier than us. So, uh, you know, we're going to go get Shashiba, but other than that, everything's going pretty well. Oh. <laughs> 
With the air temperature just above freezing, mid layers and thermal clothing were essential as the boats passed to the east of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, with the Labrador current now in full effect. As you can see, here are the shallow parts of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. It's very cold water here, very foggy as we got a southeasterly wind which completely fogs out when it gets on cold water. It's a little iceberg over here, or maybe it's not a little after all, which works its way down around the Grand Banks like that. It's only slowly drifting southwest, so as we go up to the waypoint over here, because this is the exclusion zone, we're not allowed to go in here, we'll probably see it if it wouldn't be foggy, so probably we'll see it on radar. As dawn broke, what had simply been a smudge on the screen became very much a reality as a twin peaked iceberg arrived on the horizon. Behind Caverna, EF Education remained the surprise package of the leg. Newcomer Isabelle Otissier's North Atlantic expertise proving to be a great asset for skipper Christine Guillou. While leg seven winner Brunel Sanergy was finding the fast reaching conditions much to their liking as they bedded down in mid fleet. But it was Toshiba who led on day nine. A refreshing change to their previous two bad legs. EF Language is doing what was important, keeping Swedish match behind, while sister boat EF Education was still on the front page. Sixth and seventh places were still very much in the game, a hundred miles off the pace, yet with plenty of opportunity ahead. Only Silk Cut and Chessy Racing looked too far adrift to make an impact, but after all, this is sailboat racing. Racing doesn't come cheap. High-tech boats carry a hefty price tag, and that's not even the start of it. The testing, sales, crew, and shoreside logistics all add to the bill. This round the world race will boast well over $100 million of investment across the board. The teams themselves accountable for between six to 15 million each. Sponsorship in the Whitbread appears to be on the up, but as Tracy Edwards, round the world skipper and captain of the first ever all-female crew in 1989-90 explains, it hasn't always been the case. The money was really difficult to raise for an all-female crew in 1989. Uh, it took us three years to raise the money, and we, we really did, you know, sort of sell T-shirts, sell raffle tickets, um, my house, you know, I mean, it, everything went into it. Edward's campaign was a huge success for her eventual sponsor, Royal Jordanian. And since 1990, the Whitbread has grown in profile and investment. I think the money's out there, but once again, you're, you're looking for that special company. You know, you're looking for a company with vision, um, and that, uh, you know, wants to, to do something exciting, something out of the norm, you know, that doesn't want to take a billboard around a football match. And that takes time. You've got to keep on at it. But on average, doesn't $11 million per team sound obscene? No, I don't think it's an obscene amount of money. Uh, I think that uh, it sounds about right for, for the number of boats in the race and um, the huge outlay now that the Whitbread involves. Taking a closer look at that outlay, having secured the 11 million, the cash now has to be spread over five areas. R&D, the boat, sales, logistics and salaries. A standard boat design package will set you back up to $300,000, which could double depending on additional research and the amount of tank and wind tunnel testing. If you add in the cost of a trial boat here, the R&D totals to $2 million. Building the boat is a long and highly skilled process and involves the use of high-tech materials. A fast boat is a light boat and countless man-hours are racked up ensuring just that. Similarly, keels and rigs, amongst other items, have to be up to spec. And to get a boat in racing trim on the water costs in the region of $1.9 million. Sales are key to victory. And with a limit on the number that each team can race with, finding the optimum range is an all-consuming task. The temptation is to build, build, build in search of the all-important edge. Add to that repairs and testing, and a race-winning wardrobe comes with a $1.6 million price tag. Well, a huge expense comes from flying containers, workshops, spares, and the shore team to the nine stopovers. Also included is team hotel and food bills, the entry fee and a half a million pounds contingency. Total, $2.7 million. What price for a sailor to risk his life racing through the most treacherous oceans? 
Well, general crew will go for very little, while the more skilled and experienced are on executive wages. But there has to be enough cash in the coffer to hire in the hotshot navigator and call in new hands in a crisis. A skipper's take will vary enormously, but owning a team could prove the most lucrative. Total, $2.8 million. And while salaries might be the most expensive area, there's no football wages here. Only a shrewd and scare skipper breaking through past the million dollar mark. But for the corporate companies that pay out large sums in sponsorship, is there a real and measurable return for their investment? People will argue there are formulas and you can write out on a piece of paper what the deal is. I, I think there needs to be a bit more trust and instinct in, involved in it th than that. But clearly, yes, awareness. Um, time on television, column inches in the newspapers. There's not much point putting significant sums of money into something if, if nobody knows you're doing it. This wasn't a cheap sponsorship. There's speculation about how much we, we spent. I mean, it's into the millions as well, you know, and it's for others to guess and, and, and us to, you know, not tell. It's not cheap to run a boat in the round the world the yacht race with a, with, a, with a realistic chance of winning. That perhaps hasn't happened, but we've had some great fun along the way. When Laurie Smith hasn't been hitting icebergs and breaking masts, he's been winning legs and, and setting 24-hour uh, records for, for distance covered. So phenomenally exciting and great to be involved with it. And financially, what is the measure of success? Well, well worth our investment. We're very pleased with the sponsorship. With the real dangers of fog and ice behind them, each boat could now concentrate on the best wind angle into La Rochelle. There was, however, some disagreement in what that might be, and as Sunday turned into Monday, the fleet was split 200 miles on a north-south axis with significant differences in boat speed. Wherever they were, though, the crews were surrounded by water, and daily routines prevailed, as Caverna's sailmaker, Alby Pratt, was about to discover. Alby. Half an hour? Yeah. Oh. And while Albi hit the snooze button, just behind on board Swedish Match, Matt Humphreys was coming off watch. A tight squeeze, as you can see. But when you're tired, you sleep. Good night. Meanwhile, Albi was getting used to the prospect of an on watch shift and the company of others up and down below. What are you doing, Jim? Uh, you can sit here on the toilet a bit of ocean front. I've got a comfortable uh, device designed by the skipper to be on the mast. Nice and dry up here. And I just want to remind you that while Alb is making his morning coffee, Jim is making his morning uh, business up here. So, business as usual for two of the Scandinavian boats, which at this stage in their week were holding mid fleet positions. Looks like Alb is ready. How, how long did that take, Alb? Uh, half an hour, every minute of half an hour. <laughs> and I'm late. Up at the fine end, Merritt and Toshiba were having a better start to the week, pulling out a 35 mile lead over EF language. Merritt was particularly pleased with Caverna's position, 60 miles astern, a comfortable distance from third place overall. By Tuesday, Merritt had taken the lead, barely, and was pushing hard to get away. Behind, Toshiba, with a leg win, a serious possibility, fought to hang in. The two crews resuming an all-too-familiar battle. In favourable winds, the two were making good time to France, enjoying the close combat. But it was Dalton and his crew who were the more buoyant ones, reveling in each new sked, detailing merit just pulling away. Thirty-five point nine EF. Sorry. Thirty-five point nine. Thirty-five point nine. I'm going to give you a number closer to sixty. Oh yes. Meanwhile, some way off the pack were Silk Cut and Chessie, seemingly out of the picture, miles behind and in the north. Not so now. Monday and Tuesday saw them make the most of big wins to travel a staggering five to six knots quicker than the leaders. The mileage came tumbling down. And having spent too much of last week in the southern parking lot, these two were now reveling in the somewhat fresher conditions. The crew welcomed the cold and wet, both indicating a change in their fortunes as they screamed towards the front enders. In one 18-hour period, Silk Cut clawed back 80 miles and were looking for more. 
the speed dial was showing near record breaking runs. Ideal conditions for Smith and his crew. EF Language, meanwhile, were playing it safe. Kayard had a watchful eye on the battling Toshiba and Merritt in front, but in the overall scheme, he knew they couldn't hurt him. Swedish match was 20 miles behind, and perhaps his only irritation was sister boat, EF Education, who were sailing the best leg of their race and dueling with the champions elect. Isabella Tissier's input already tangible. As predicted, however, it was soon to be all changed. Within hours, Silk Cut's northerly route saw it storm through to second place, displacing Toshiba, which was also overtaken by EF Language. Pundits, however, took little indication from the positions. 2,700 miles completed and 60 miles between first and last, the race was a long cry from over. By the close of day 11, the fleet were on the brink of what promised to be some of the most difficult sailing in the race so far. A high-pressure system stretched over a thousand miles, north to south, offering a band of windless sea that would inevitably stall the front runners and enable the rest of the fleet to catch up. Silkcut and Chessie, still benefiting from the stronger airs in the north, were for the moment unconcerned about the ridge, being its main beneficiaries. By Thursday, Silkcut were comfortable in their second spot, whilst Chessie racing, power reaching and 30 knots had also made dramatic advances on the fleet. But with a high pressure ridge lurking in the distance, both boats were fully aware that their dramatic progress could be just as easily reversed in the coming days. Merritt, pushed back to third, were beginning to think of changing tactics as a result of the approaching front. It's still hard facing the leg, but as the boat split north-south to such a huge extent, we can't be everywhere, and although we think uh, where we are is probably about as good as any, we've heard to the south to um, get back in contact with Kipper and Swedish Match, who are really our, our uh, main challenges, or in Swedish Match's case, we'd like to nail a few places on them. By the start of day 12, Toshiba had hit the front, and their progress came to a virtual standstill. Silk Cut powered on to take over the lead, and Chessie moved up to third. Further to the south, positions shuffled over the next few hours, as the girls' boat moved up to fourth, and former leader Merritt dropped to fifth, diving south to cover Caverna and Swedish Match. Brunel continued to bring up the rear. By midday on Thursday, most of the fleet had hit the high-pressure zone, triggering the predicted concertina effect. It's not, not too much for the blue boat to do here, approaching uh, Bay, Bay of Biscay and the Finnish in France. Still in quite good company, EF Language and Merit Captain Clan are close to us. We're all way down the fleet. We're still 500 miles to go, and with these fluky predictions on the wind, we see what's happening. Well, we're going to keep an eye on Merit Cup from now on. Ahead and slightly further north, EF Language and Sixth were still obsessively marking the Swedes at the same time as dealing with less appetizing challenges on board. We're down here watching our buddies on the blue boat, Swedish Match, and um, unfortunately progress has slowed as we've entered this high pressure ridge, and now the wind shifted from the east, which is uh, bad because that means we have to go upwind. But the good news is we can smell the croissants with the easterly breeze. So uh, boys are looking forward to a little cafe au lait and croissants, maybe Sunday morning if we're lucky. As night falls, Toshiba were back in the lead, with Silk Cut four miles behind. As the fleet continues to carve its way through the light airs, the crews find ways to pass time. <laughs> Reading. So that's very good. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to bring it, but I bought it. By daybreak, the scenario could have changed altogether, as more than in any other leg, the outcome is anything but predictable. On day 13, Toshiba had managed to keep their lead, albeit dwindling. Chessie, 38 miles behind the leaders, had a good stretch on the girls, who were now in threat from Merritt in fifth. EF Language's continued lead over Swedish Match appears to have confirmed their overall race victory, but with 300 miles to go, who knows what lies ahead. After 14 days racing, the majority of the fleet were grouped in the south. Brunel in last, chasing Caverna. Just ahead, Swedish match, with EF language in front, but following their every move. 
Merritt was in there keeping an eye on Caverna. The girls on EF Education leading the bunch and looking good. Chesy further north were up to third with Toshiba and Silk Cut battling for the lead. How's it go, Roy? At the front on board Toshiba, crew morale was understandably high, despite the ominous shadow lurking off their starboard bow. Today we've been attacked by a shark. Um, we're a bit disappointed to see Silk Cut after having a commanding lead of about uh, 120 miles for most of this leg. Um, suddenly they came back from the dead, which was most disappointing, particularly for me. Um, but, but there we go. Uh, so it's my old pommy mates over there. With Gordon Maguire at the helm, Silk Cut was maintaining the pressure despite the lightning breeze. Well, this should be an interesting boat speed test. Both boats using different rigs. Breathes up to a huge 6.3 knots. So the battle continued as Silk Cut and Toshiba entered the home straight with a substantial 50 mile lead over the pack to the south and a 30 mile lead over third place Chessy Racing to the north. Taking advantage of their better angle of approach into La Rochelle, Chessy was screaming south under masthead spinnaker and recording by far the best boat speeds as they consolidated their third position. Back in fourth and much further south, the girls on EF Education were enjoying their best leg of the race and preparing for France. Oh, well, heading towards La Rochelle and Christine's given me a few sort of, a few little uh, words to say and apparently this means hi, how are you? You ready? Yeah. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi, sister? How do you think that'll go? That'll be a good one in the bar tonight. Hi, how are you? <laughs> the girls on EF were jubilant, but there was a far more sombre mood on board Merrick Cup, ten miles further back in fifth place. Having led for much of the leg, Grant Dalton's decision to bear south and cover Innovation Caverna was costing him dear. And now both Chessy Racing and Silk Cut will be challenging his third place overall. Whilst the defending champion languished in fifth, the champions elect EF language were one place further back, concentrating on the only boat which could prevent them from wrapping up this whip red round the world race with one leg to spare. What, seriously? The fleet's compressed quite a bit. We've got the leaders up to the north, and we're down here watching our buddies on the blue boat, Swedish match. It was always going to be a tall order for Gunnar Krantz and his men to overhaul EF language. But after nine months at sea, it's hard to settle for second best. Meanwhile, it was Toshiba who continued to set the pace as La Rochelle loomed in the distance. Following the disappointments of the race so far, a morale-boosting leg victory was tantalisingly close. But, unfortunately for Toshiba, so too was Silk Cut, waiting to pounce on any tactical blunder which might present them with their own chance for victory. At about 5.30 p.m. local time, Toshiba and Silk Cut were still locked in battle just 17 miles from the finish line. Up ahead, the island of Ile de Ré, 15 miles long and disturbing the clear winds the boats were enjoying in open sea. With the seconds ticking away, Laurie Smith knew that his only hope of passing Toshiba rested on his opponent parking up in light air. With the British boat acknowledged as the faster of the two, Smith closed in on compatriot Paul Stanbridge. However, with Toshiba blocking their run to the finish line, it was unlikely they would overhaul them. An alternate course of action was required. With Smith at the helm, the British boat squeezed downwind and made a move towards the inside track, shortening their distance to the finish line. With the wind changing up ahead, the push inshore was a gamble to put the British boat at a more favourable angle. On board Toshiba, skipper Paul Stanbridge, desperate to hold off the challenge of Laurie Smith, jibed once more and headed offshore in an attempt to find better breeze. Having muscled their way to the front of the field, the crew on board Silk Cut had little to lose in attacking the leader into La Rochelle. Speculate to accumulate was the philosophy behind the British boat's run inshore. The tension built as Toshiba sailed into lighter breeze. Agonising moments for Stanbridge and crew. Great. Behind, Laurie Smith was going quicker and gaining ground. For several moments, it looked good for Smith on the inside track. 
Yet as Toshiba found better breeze, Silk Cut was in the shadow of Ilda Ray and was forced to head out to sea. Toshiba had won the day and crossed the finish line. A vital victory and a great personal moment for Stanbridge, beating friend and mentor Laurie Smith. I have sailed with Laurie quite a lot and I know he will never ever give up. And it's obviously not me against Laurie, it's, it's a team thing and I've got, um, you know, Ross MacDonald doing the tactics and most of the driving on the boat and Steve Cotton, uh, our other tactician, uh, Murray Ross's navigator and a, and a team of international sailors. So, you know, I'm not doing it single-handedly by any means. But Laurie perhaps was trying to tempt you to go inshore? Yes, I mean, Laurie could have um, narrowed the gap by following us, but he knows he would net well. He probably wouldn't overtake us following. Um, so yeah, he banged the corners, and they didn't pay off, but corners seldom do. Having banged the corners, Laurie Smith had time to reflect on the headaches of leg eight. No, the reason that they got ahead so much was the reason that we came back to them, you know, the pressure system went through and then they fell out of it and we came on the new one. We nearly got them right at the end here, but... Yeah, right at the end of the island? Yeah. We ran out of wind and we thought, oh, like, but um, <laughs> it filled in from their side. You know. It's good that they won, you know, they've, they've had even worse than we've had in this race, so uh, it's about time we had a break. We need to get a, another uh, very hard score on the next leg and um, if, the, if the people come in in the right order, then we, we could get second, I'm sure. I haven't looked at the points, but I know, I know it must be a lot closer than we were. Darkness in La Rochelle, and about three hours after the first two boats crossed the finish line, Chesy Racing come home in third. A terrific performance by skipper John Kostecki, as Merrick Cup and Caverna, their biggest rivals for a podium finish in Southampton, are further down the fleet. 200 miles off the pace and in last position after the first few days at sea, Chesy had made the most of their good judgment and good fortune to salvage the leg and record their fourth podium finish of the race. We're real happy with uh, getting third, another podium finish. Uh, we accomplished our goal this leg. We're in the hunt to uh, be in the top three in the final uh, results. Navigator Juan Villa bore the brunt of the champagne celebrations for a job well done. This is what's great about the race this time with this point system. Here we are, we're in the ninth inning, ninth leg, as they say in baseball, the ninth inning. It's the bottom of the ninth and you got a chance, you know, to move up in the standings big time. I'm glad they have the point system. Five hours behind Chesi came the girls on EF Education. Despite missing out on a podium finish in La Rochelle, fourth place here represents a magnificent achievement for skipper Christine Guiu. Undoubtedly a dream come true, arriving in her home port in a position that so many of the other teams felt was richly deserved. Good crew, uh, good, uh, good time, you know, it was really very, very nice for us. It was the best leg of the, and we arrived in France, it was the best leg of the regret for us, for the position to arrive in France, for the crew, for everything, it was great. And for you? I can achieve the best one, I didn't the other, so, uh, but it was great, uh, really, to, to work with all this team, everybody doing the best, and uh, you can feel the, the team together, I mean, very good spirit. And that's really great for me. I'm used to sail alone, and sailing with such a crew is really fantastic. You've only got one little stop next, so yeah. um, podium position next time? You bet. Oh, yeah. It can only get better. <laughs> so, one in the eye for all the girl detractors as EF Education chalked up their most impressive performance to date. Behind the girls came Merrick Cup, whose skipper Grant Dalton once said that if the girls ever beat him, he'd stab himself with his dividers. Well, the moment of truth finally arrived in La Rochelle. Yeah, I modified that though. I said I'd stick a pineapple up my ass as well. <laughs> I thought that was some guys from the Toshiba tent. So, yeah, they uh, did a good job. They did a good job. And they sailed really well. They positioned the boat nicely and, and they did well. And Toshiba broke left to go into the north and we sort of therefore had to make a decision. Do we go with Toshiba, cover Toshiba? And they may be wrong here, go the wrong way, or go and cover at Caverna in the south. And it was a really easy decision, you know, that we went, we went right to, to, to cover our opposition. Nearly 50 minutes later and out of the Atlantic darkness sailed the F language. Their sixth place on this leg guaranteeing them the coveted position of winners of the Whip Red Round the World race for the Volvo Trophy. Success for skipper Paul Coward on his first attempt at this ocean racing challenge. I think the big key for us was what we learned on leg two, not being afraid to criticise ourselves and look ourselves in the mirror 
in Fremantle and say, what did we do wrong? Where did we go wrong? Let's sort this out now. Let's document it and then review that in Auckland before leg five and go out in leg five and kick butt. And that was the Whitbread Round the World race for EF Language right there. So, with a leg to spare, EF Language has won the Volvo Trophy by beating their only rival, Swedish Match. On hand to welcome their teammates to France were the jubilant crew from EF Education, celebrating a big night for Team EF. Yeah, Rob, you must have felt the boat was good, no? Yeah. <laughs> Dawn in La Rochelle and Swedish Match arrive in France after a disappointing leg eight. The race across the Atlantic had at one stage seen them ideally positioned at the front of the fleet with their rival EF language further behind. But the Swedish boat nosedived after they received some wrong weather information. Seventh in the La Rochelle meant their best hope now will be defending second overall. Our first place is, is what it is today, second and third is totally up in the air. Anything can happen, we have to finish among the four first on the next leg. And we are going to cover merit, we're going to play it very conservatively and uh, really go for the second place, that's all we can do. <laughs> Despite a disappointing eighth place finish, the mood in the Caverna camp remained upbeat as the Norwegian supporters serenaded their heroes ashore. Having trained in the North Atlantic, the leg eight weather had been a major letdown for the Norwegian action men. Yeah, it was all icebergs. Oh, not scary. I know some other skippers that said it was very scary. But uh, our man to man talks are more about Jim's birthday and his birthday party. And, you know, we tough it out. Had to tough it out. In the end, Caverna did well to hold off a spirited late surge from Brunel Sanergy, who crossed the finish line just behind the Norwegians. Despite coming home ninth and last, the Dutchman was still smiling. What now? Boots. Yeah? We didn't see any brutal weather, we didn't see any icebergs. Um, I couldn't grow my beard, um, so I still don't feel like a woodbread sailor. So EF language cannot be caught and will be celebrating their Whitbread victory in Southampton. Swedish match must defend their position, but they have the comfort that third place Merit are under attack from behind. Chessy Racing and Silk Cut, both looking to get onto the podium. Innovation Caverna need a brilliant last result and some luck to get in the prizes, but behind them, well, Toshiba would love to end with two firsts. EF Education, key not to be the only one without a top three finish. <laughs>